Hello, and welcome to this month's episode of the Distance Learning Roundtable Show on the Incandescent Radio Network. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, producer of the show, where experts gather to discuss the future of online education. It's an honor to introduce you to the host of the show, Pat Casella, who is the executive director of the U.S. Distance Learning Association, and Dean Hoke, managing partner of the international organization Edu Alliance. We are super thrilled to have today's guest here with us, Dr. Peter Noonan. He is the superintendent of the Falls Church City Public Schools in Northern Virginia. Among his many awards and accomplishments, in 2009, Peter was named one of the top 10 educators in America under the age of 40 by the Scholastic Administrator. Very impressive, and so are all of his accomplishments. Actually, Peter and I worked together for more than a decade when I was the communications director for the city of Fairfax schools in Northern Virginia. So I had the privilege of watching him in action and today you all do too. So now I'll kick it over to Pat to tell us more about Peter. Thanks a lot, Hope. Uh, as Hope noted, today's guest is Falls Church City Public School Superintendent, Dr. Peter Noonan. He is a longtime educator who received his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Mexico and his doctorate in education from Virginia Tech. Peter started his career as a special education teacher in New Mexico. And as Hope mentioned, there he was named Teacher of the Year back in 1993. Means he has some good experience to share. Most recently, he served as superintendent for the Fairfax City Public Schools after serving 11 years in the Fairfax County Public Schools Division. At Fairfax County, he was the assistant principal at Langley High School, principal at Lanier Middle School, and Centerville High School, as well as assistant superintendent for cluster is it seven schools, cluster seven. Peter was the assistant superintendent for the instructional services department, overseeing academic programs for the system's 180,000 students. Welcome, Peter. We are delighted to have you with us. Thank you very much, Pat. I appreciate that. I always um, worry when someone reads my my bio. It one either looks like I can't keep a job, <laughs> or or I, I always wish that somebody from my family would hear you saying it because it actually sounds like I've done something in my career. So thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having. Thanks for being here. I'm going to turn the first question over to uh, to Dean Hoke. Very good. Welcome. Good to have you on, and hopefully in terms of audience, we'll at least have your parents and we'll have your kiddos and your wife and everybody else kind of listening here and going, oh yeah, that's him. He's very good at this. <laughs> Look, one of the things I'd like to talk about first is the school district itself, the, the Falls City, but I'm saying Falls City, that's not right. Falls Church Public City Schools. That's a bit of a mouthful, but I'm going to get that right. I'd like to know a little bit more about the school district. I'd like to know a little bit more about the demographics. Tell us about your district. Yeah, well, thanks for the question. Um, and, and again, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about um, one of my favorite things, which is the Falls Church City Public Schools. Um, so, so Falls Church um, City is an interesting city that is situated in the greater DC sort of metroplex area, if you will. Um, we're fi five miles uh, due west from downtown Washington, D.C., and sandwiched between Arlington County and Fairfax County. Um, we're an independent school system that has been uh, independent uh, for nearly a decade or nearly a century, excuse me, now um, that broke away many, many years ago um, when Falls Church um, wanted to create their own their own public school system. And uh, so it's it's a small school system. Um, we serve uh, from pre-K to 12, about 2,800 students, um, which is not a lot. In fact, um, the high school where I was principal that, that Pat talked about um, was larger in student population than the entire city of Falls Church schools. But, um, but I love the, the uh, unique nature of, of our school division insofar as it's also very diverse. Um, it's not... Uh, it's it's be growing uh, more economically diverse. We have a, a larger um, population of students on free and reduced lunch than we've had in the past um, into double digits now. It is one of the more wealthy districts in um, all of in the whole of Virginia. Um, we have a, a, a diverse community um, relative to race and ethnicity as well, um, with a lot of uh, students who are speakers of other languages in our in our division. 
Um, and a big part of that is that um, we also serve um, a unique place, I think, in um, sort of the, the broader context in, in that we um, serve a lot of students that are State Department students, a lot of students um, who are diplomat students um, because of our, our proximity to Washington, D.C. And so there's a significant number of our students that are also third considered third culture kids um, that live here as well. So um, it is a, a very diverse community ethnically um, and growing diversity in um, economics as well. Um, but the entire Falls Church City population is about 16,000. Um, but around us is uh, over 1.5 million. So we've got we've got a lot, we're small, small school division in a big area. Well, let me ask a quick follow-up question to that. And is it a transient? population, I mean, or or is that a fairly settled region? In other words, you're talking about diplomats and, and people with State Department. Does that mean in terms of the students that you have that they're not necessarily going to go through the full experience or they're going to transfer to other schools eventually? That's a great question. Um, we, we see that um, uh, approximately uh, 15 to 20 percent of our kids turn over every year. Uh, oh. And and most of them are for reasons of being transferred in or out from uh, different stations and posts. Very good. Pat? Thanks, Dean. Um, so second question, uh, Peter, in, in our conversations that we've had with school districts across the country, uh, the COVID pandemic was not something that most public and private K-12 schools were really prepared for. It kind of happened overnight, um, especially in providing education in a virtual world. Can you tell us a little bit about your district experience uh, during that time and how you took this monumental challenge uh, ranging from students to teachers to parents? How did you manage it? Um, well, it sort of depends on who you ask sometimes, but I think I think overall we did a really great job um, on balance. But you're you're absolutely right, Pat. I think that all of this took a lot of us by surprise. Um, but we we were um, it, it's interesting, you know, sort of living in the D.C. area. Um, it almost feels like we have our our finger on the pulse a little bit differently than other parts of the country where I've lived in the past and. Things seem to be, we're a little bit more vigilant around some things that we try to see coming and the like. Um, so it, it's interesting that, um, uh, just a quick story, I was hosting a, an administrative retreat for all of our school leaders, um, and it actually was um, on, I want to say, uh, around, on or around um, March, I want to say 7th or 8th of 2020. And when we were at my house and, and holding this retreat, um, we saw that things were getting getting worse with the pandemic. And I said to our team, you know, when you get back to school, we actually pivoted our retreat. We had a, a full morning. And then in the afternoon, I said, we're going to do something different in the afternoon. And in the afternoon, I said, when you get back to your schools, it would be really great if um, you could ask your teachers to develop two weeks of lesson plans <laughs> in case we need to close. And I said, would that be would that be hard to do? And they said, no, no, we'll go back and do it. And um, so they went back to their schools and asked the teachers to develop their two weeks of lesson plans. And so they did. And uh, and then on Friday, the 13th, um, here in the Commonwealth of Virginia um, in 2020, March 13th, I'll never forget, um, we closed schools. And, and um, what was unique about it for us is I think that we were prepared um, in as best we could for a global pandemic in that. Um, we we have a one-to-one -one school division here, meaning that every single one of our kids has a laptop or some technology that they um, have available to them. Um, we were able to set up a system where all of our kids could come in and get their technology um, even after we closed that first week. And we were able to stand up our online um, program within the first week of being out of school. And part of the reason we were able to do that was not only because of the one-on-one -on -one approach that we have with technology, but also our teachers had two weeks of lesson plan sort of in the can, if you will, and ready to, to rock and roll with. So um, so we were able to, to really stand something up really quickly um, through the technology that we have. Um, and I, I certainly don't mean to throw my colleagues in the region um, under the bus or anything, but I do know that we were, and, and I'm very proud of this, we were the first to stand up school 
um, and be back uh, one week following that, less than one week following that closure. That's great. That's a, a good accomplishment right, right in itself there. Um, Dean, I'm going to turn question three over to you. Very good. Well, let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, and particularly, we've talked to school districts and universities throughout the world about this. And we've heard all kinds of different versions of how people dealt with it, but it was still a madhouse. I, I don't think there's just any other way of, of putting it. What I'm curious about, one of the things that I've heard a great deal about was trying to find champions within mm. the, the school or the university or wherever you were, because not everybody, as you know, is exactly you know, a real maven when it comes to distance learning and knowing how to do things. I'm curious in your situation, you've talked about the lesson plans and you talked about others, but did you find even within the school itself and some of the teachers, did you have particular champions and maybe mentors that could really help the others as they were trying to figure this out? Yeah, it's a, it's also a great question. And, and the answer to that is yes. Um, it took us some time to find them. Um, find sort of the, the, I guess I would separate it out a little bit between the formal champions and the informal champions. Yeah. Um, because I, I would say that we did have a number of formal champions from our folks uh, at each of our schools that are responsible for the technology and for working through distance learning and the like. Um, but at the same time, um, as time progressed over, you know, two, three weeks of being online, we did have some teachers that were struggling to, um, you know, integrate their curriculum into a digital format where they were working with kids and, and how do they do that to keep engagement um, high and allow kids to, to work. And so um, we did put it out to a number of our teachers um, throughout the division and asked them to share best practices. And ultimately, we we landed with some real a really nice sort of model of what best practices for curriculum and instruction look like in an online environment that our teachers then adopted um, from March, um, end of March, early April, on to the end um, of uh, to the end of the year. Um, so we did find some folks that did that. We also had a number of, of people that, um, you know, there are sort of tricks of the, I don't want to call them tricks of the trade because they're not tricks, you know, they're, they're actual practices that are good. Um, but we found that some of our teachers were better than others at some of these practices. And as a consequence, not only were they able to share those with people, but they were also able to, to send them through video um, and, and show them that, you know, they might record their screen, they might utilize some of that technology differently. And then, um, and then as that morphed, you know, and, and we came back to school, and this is sort of a, a mo that was a moment of pivot for us. And it kind of gets back to, to Pat's question a little bit too, is, um, you know, once we made it through that first eight, March, April, May, June, through the summer, um, we did come back to school. Um, we did come back to school, um, uh, not right away, but we um, in September brought back our, our students that needed the most support, so our English language learners, some of our special education students and the like, and then we're able to bring back the rest of our students later in the fall, um, but did it through cohorting of kids. Um, and so we were able to then have some kids in the building, some kids at home, and then they would flip flop um, throughout the week. And what was really great about that was there were some really great practices that grew out of that in terms of engagement of kids that were in front of you and also kids that were at home and online. And that became um, something that many of our, uh, our teachers really embraced. Um, and we were able to hold up some of our teachers as models of excellence. Um, and some people really ran with it and, and enjoyed it. Um, and, and our kids continued to learn. And I think that by, by the end of the pandemic, I think the proof was um, sort of in the in the results, if you will, um, and to, to the extent that uh, Falls Church City Public Schools didn't see the decline in learning that um, many others around the country and, and across the globe did. In fact, um, not only now are we back to pre-pandemic conditions, we've exceeded um, where we were pre-pandemic. So the learning losses, if, if there were significant learning losses, they've all been recaptured, recouped, and now we're exceeding where we were pre-pandemic. Well, Peter, let me a quick follow up to that. And I think you've kind of answered some questions that I was thinking about. But in particular, now that you've gone through the pandemic, you've used distance in the way that you've used it. 
how does it apply to the work that your teachers, your instructors are doing today? Have they learned some new lessons? Are there some new tricks in the trade that they've learned? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, and, and Dean, one of the things, just to sort of backtrack a little bit as I answer that question, was that um, we did use some of our federal funds that we received um, for That's ARPA right. to outfit our schools with, and, and we were in the middle of a construction project of a brand new high school. So we were able to go back and retrofit that high school, you know, everybody say it with me, change order. You know, a change order in construction is not easy, but we were able to put a change order in um, where each one of our classrooms um, had a mounted camera in the middle of the room um, that we were able to use. So. Um, so every single one of our classrooms across the division has been outfitted with some sort of distance learning opportunity. And, and what we're seeing now sort of as a consequence of that is the tricks that that we learned or, or the best practices that we learned actually translate into everyday practices um, around engagement, around structure, um, around um, intervention, if you will. And so we find ourselves using technology differently than we have. Um, and I think that's sort of getting to some of the question that you're asking. Um, to the extent that we have um, some students that have utilized the technology that we have available from across the globe, um, when their parents have been deployed who our State Department oversees and need access to our curriculum, need access to our registration, you know, it's, it's so much easier now to be able to hop on a call, you know, and, and have a conversation or to meet with a teacher or to do a tour of our high school, for example, for students that are coming in. Um, our Russian diplomats were uh, evacuated during the during the, um, the the Ukrainian invasion. And so being able to share uh, with those parents what our schools look like as their stu students were coming in was really important. Um, and so we're very, very excited about that. And then um, also we've, we've sort of changed the way that we um, work through uh, students, students that are sick. Um, so uh, students that are sick, for example, um, that are out for extended periods of time can access our classrooms anytime, anywhere. Um, and then the other thing that we've um, started to do, and, and I don't know how well received this is among the kids, if I'm honest, um, but one of the things that we are, are doing with our kids is on snow days, if we have more than three, um, we move to an online learning opportunity. So there have mm -hmm. been times here in Northern Virginia where we've been out and, and hope you might remember for up to two weeks at a time, um, because in this area, we're crippled by 12 inches of snow uh, for a long period of time. And now if we're out for more than three days, um, we'll move to an online environment for our kids. So we're trying to use it as, in as many ways as we possibly can. And, and the last thing I'll say is that um, we are a very... Um, unique school in that we're our high school specifically um, serves just under 900 kids. It's a, a comprehensive um, 9, 12 school, um, but there are kids that want to take some of the very unique classes that we might not be able to offer, um, and we are able to offer some of those and also offer it to other schools through the technology that we have that's available as well. So one example is super critical languages like um, Arabic. Um, we have some students that may be taking Arabic through the online environment. Wow. I'm going to have to go over there and learn my Arabic a little bit more. That's a great <laughs> way to do it. Pat, your question. Absolutely. Um, Peter, um, yes. you know, I've seen some really clever ways to use distance learning uh, over the years. One that comes to mind is certainly virtual field trips, and it dates back probably 15 years, if not longer. Right? Um, share some of your thoughts on where you think the future of distance learning is headed in K-12. You know, we see it very well adopted in higher education and it's almost like the K-12 marketplace kind of resists it sometimes. You know, what do you see as the future for distance learning in the K-12 environment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it opens up, well, first of all, I think it opens up the world. And, and one of the things, at least in our division, you know, we're a pre-K-12 international baccalaureate school division in Falls Church City, and we're one of seven in the country, which means that we offer um, a, a curriculum from pre-K to 12 that's really rooted in a global context. And I, I think uh, when we talk about research and we start, and, and that's a big piece of the international baccalaureate program too, is being able to 
to effectively research and effectively find information um, within a global context um, to be able to uh, get first person information from from people across the world is so much more valuable than um, looking at a video about um, something that happened. And so as an example of that, if we're if we're doing some research on the Ukrainian um, invasion um, by Russia, um, how much more powerful is it for our and you, um, Russian, by the way, is the second most commonly spoken language in the city of Falls Church. Um, but how much more powerful is it for our kids to connect with a family who's in Ukraine via distance learning to interview them instead of, um, you know, researching some articles that that talk about what their experiences are. So, so being able to have those first person primary source conversations, I think is extraordinary. Um, I also think the future of distance learning for us is that it really becomes anytime, anywhere. Um, and, and having access to the best and, and the brightest that there are out there to teach. Um, I think that we, we have fantastic teachers in the City of Falls Church schools, so, and I would put them up against anybody in the world. Um, but if there's a content or a curriculum that our students really want to have access to, um, and they want to get it from the, you know, the best teacher in California, why, why aren't we leveraging that opportunity um, to, to have that chance? Um, or, you know, if we have students that are struggling with learning, and, and we all know that in every school division across America, we have these gaps in learning. And, and if I'm a fourth grade teacher and, and I'm teaching a concept like elapsed time, which is a really hard concept for kids to understand in fourth grade, and, and there's only five fourth grade teachers that teach in my school, and none of us are really good at teaching it. Why aren't we providing access to the best person who teaches elapsed time in the country? Um, and then and then even recording it or, or um, putting it down and codifying it somehow so that we have some really good strategies and skills. I think there's a an opportunity for a collaboration, um, Pat, that I think is remarkably different than what we have experienced. And I think that, that distance learning can really shrink in many ways the, the world so that our kids have the best access possible to the best teachers um, in, in the world. And, and I'd love to see it sort of move in that direction. So I would say through the, the research primary sources and having access to the best um, that are out there is something that can be really powerful. And even if they're not their, their fourth grade teacher, but even if they're accessing this person for extra time and support for learning, um, you're hearing a different voice and somebody who's truly an expert at, at what they're talking about. So I think there's a variety of, of ways that we can look at it differently um, that unfortunately um, in the in the pre-K-12 space, um, the change, is, change is hard. It's, it's very slow um, uh, and, and methodical. Um, and the system, you know, when anytime you're changing a system, um, the system always wins, uh, it seems like. So how do you change a culture? of a system that allows for new ideas to come in. And I think that will be the challenge for leaders um, into the to the rest of the century. Uh, great insights, Peter. I mean, it's always the challenge of how do you actually make it happen in the K-12 environment? Um, you know, it's something I've noticed, especially the younger kids, they really need that physical interaction. So it's almost that hybrid, you almost have to take that hybrid approach, right? We don't want a world of introverts, I mean, you know, have to have your both your balance of introverts and extroverts. But um, yeah, so, so that's thanks for sharing that. That is uh, some good information. Dean, I'm going to pass it over to you for the final question. Very good. Peter, let's we haven't had much of a chance to talk about you. We've talked about the school district. We've talked mm -hmm. about distance learning. I'd like our audience to find out a little bit more about you and, and quite frankly, a little bit about leadership style, because I think that's an important element to the field of distance learning and educational management. And I'm gonna do a little bit of bio, but I'm gonna kind of ask you about something here. I mean, you come from teaching ranks. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you've been pretty much a career teacher who's moved into supervision, who's moved into administration, who's become a superintendent. You obviously must've been a pretty good teacher. Um, 1993, your teacher of the year in Albuquerque. And also the other side I found interesting, you're a special ed teacher. You come from that side of the field, and I know it's very different in terms of 
of teaching and learning and how you prepare. And I'm curious, did you find being a special ed teacher helped you in being a, a superintendent I, in terms of approach, individualism, things like that? Uh, the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, the long answer is um, it's very personal to me. Um, and, and without um, going into too much detail, um, I, I'll share that uh, coming through school was really hard for me. Um, and it wasn't until I, I got to college that I found out that I, I had dyslexia and dysgraphia. And um, so in my first assistant principal interview that I was uh, on, which I fortunately got, they asked me to bring an artifact uh, that speaks to um, sort of my experiences in education. And I brought one of those old five and a half inch floppy disks. I think they were five and a half inch, but you know, you mm -hmm. can flip them around. And, and, and that really made a difference for me in my career as a, as an educator, because I would have never been able to make it through school if it had not been for technology. So the idea of, of special education and working with students that need a differentiated approach to teaching and a differentiated approach to learning and a differentiated approach to um, you know, products that they're, they're putting out um, is, is super important to me. Um, and the, the notion of that individualized approach translates and transcends, I think, way beyond special education, particularly now. Uh, and what we're seeing um, in the best practices for teaching uh, in curriculum and instruction is that it really does require an individualized, differentiated approach for every single one of our kids. And the one size fits all model of instruction just doesn't work. And I think the technology um, is, is extremely important to allowing for that to happen. Um, you know, it, we talk a lot about, you know, what, what is technology? It's, it's just another tool in the kit. But again, I, I think what it does is it allows for um, students to collaborate differently, students to integrate their thinking differently, um, students to produce differently um, than they ever have before. And, and now that they're able to create products that are differentiated to meet their individual skill and their individual um, levels of ability um, is extremely important. So I think that, that my background in special ed and coming with that very individualized approach has helped me um, immensely in the superintendency. And, and I often, as I mentioned before, this idea of the gap, you know, I, I talk about um, not to be flipped, but timely and tailored intervention that's by name and by need. And that's both for kids that need extra time and support for learning, but it's also for kids who need um, differentiation and extension in their learning as well. And um, this, this digital um, uh, work really allows kids to go into much more depth and complexity in their learning than they ever have before. And they can do that on an individual basis. So, so Dean, it's a long, long way to get to your question, but um, you know, my experiences in special ed and the, and the idea of it coming down to the individual level has been extremely helpful in my, my work as a superintendent. I think that's great. And, and I'm delighted to hear you talk about that and the individualism and the challenges and the opportunities that come with it. Hope, I'm turning it over to you. <laughs> well, thank you. What an interesting conversation, Peter. You're always knocking it out of the park as far as I'm concerned. And we've had so many conversations about how the K to 12 world is like turning a cruise ship. You know, it's not right. a boat. There's not it's a, a nimble. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. And that everyone needs an IEP, right? I mean, it's true in the universe. <laughs> so why not start in K to 12? So here's to you taking it to the next level and uh, doing great job in Northern Virginia. And here's to uh, the distance learning world. See what we can all do together. I think that's really exciting. So thank you to our audience. You are listening to the Distance Learning Roundtable Show on the Incandescent Radio Network. This is our February show, and we are thrilled to be featuring Dr. Peter Noonan. So thank you, Pat. Thank you, Dean. And thank you, audience, for listening. We will talk to you again next month.